I think um, I think uh, the recording has started. OK, uh, that is perfect. So hello, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for joining us today. We have uh, a very special guest uh, who is a young, talented woman from Tunisia. Uh, her name is Sahar bin Rashid. Uh, she is a, um, a, research, a research master's can, master's candidate in nanotechnology at the Faculty of Sciences of Tunisia in of Tunis El Manara in Tunisia. She is currently a quantum computing research intern at the Institute for Data Processing and Electronics, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Her work is focused on hardware control of superconducting quantum chips and quantum compilers. She is a Cascade advocate and also the co-founder and local coordinator of Q Tunisia. She is also a leader uh, in the Q Cousins uh, port in Q World. So, Without further ado, um, welcome with us today, Sahar, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karim. Thank you for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that um, you will find this presentation on Transmon qubits very insightful. And it will have, uh, and by the end of it, you will have a better understanding of how uh, the superconducting quantum computers are actually working and encoding data. So um, I will start my presentation. So um, thank you again for the for the invitation, Karim, and all the group from Alexandria Quantum Computing uh, Group for quantum uh, yeah for quantum computing. So for the plan of the <laughs> thank you, Karim. So for the plan of today, uh, I wanted to keep the presentation simple yet very insightful to give all the necessary information of how we can build and design a, a transmon qubit, which is a kind of superconducting qubit. There are so many different types. And uh, especially, I wanted to make sure that by the end of this, uh, we will all have uh, an understanding of how uh, really the superposition is, for example, manifesting in such uh, kind of qubit, uh, but also uh, why we also cho chose this specific device to have as um, a candidate for qubit. So first of all, I would like to, to present what is a quantum computer from very broad overview, and then the available hardware technologies today, and then I would like to go through the DiVincenzo criteria, which would define whether technology is a good candidate to be uh, a hardware technology for a quantum computer. Then I would go uh, in depth with the physics of a transmon qubit. So uh, that would be the part when we would uh, talk about the uh, quantum mechanics involved uh, in the design of qubits. And then I would like to go through the Rabi oscillations, which is the real manifestation of superposition in uh, qubits. And then I would go through the basic engineering steps for uh, the transmon qubit uh, building. And in the end, I would like to go through the qubit control. So how do we create gates uh, based on the transmon qubit? So what is a quantum computer overall? A quantum computer takes advantage of some fundamental phenomena of quantum mechanics, so uh, mainly superposition, entanglement, and interference to deliver more important processing speed. And this is the uh, most important feature of uh, the quantum computer and why its advantages in some cases compare to the conventional computer that we use today. So quantum machines are expected to outperform even the most powerful uh, com computation machines available today, which are the supercomputers. And this is, of course, in terms of efficiency to solve certain problems. And the main difference between a quantum computer and the conventional computer actually lays in the unit of information that we need in both sciences and both uh, engineering fields, which is um, the logical qubits, which are, uh, sorry, the logical bits, which are used in conventional um, computers, and they are based on electronics laws, not quantum mechanics. And the qubit or the quantum bit, uh, which can actually physically be a photon, electron, electron spin, or uh, a transmon, like we will see in this presentation. And the qubit uh, is mainly have uh, the advantage of being in a superposition, in a superposition of states um, other than uh, zero or one, uh, in addition to the entanglement and the interference features. So quantum computers efficiency scale with the number of qubits. The more qubits we have, the more we uh, approach the fault tolerant um, design of quantum chips. And uh, this is actually the end goal in the end, which is to have a quantum processor which uh, have which has enough number of qubits in order to save 
say that it's uh, of a high fidelity device and we can say that it is a universal quantum computer that we can use for certain applications and we can have uh, trust in its uh, results. So the goal, for example, for a company like IBM, which is one of the leaders in the in the field, uh, which is to create a quantum chip of 1 million qubits uh, within 10 years. So that is the goal until 2030, uh, which is the year we expect that quantum computer would achieve a certain uh, maturity uh, as a technology. So this photo here actually shows a small uh, quantum chip of seven qubits. So this is actually the chip on which we have our uh, qubits installed and of course, uh, of course, um, coupled uh, with resonators in order to ensure the interaction between um, the external uh, control system, but also between the qubits uh, themselves. This, of course, this chip would go into the cryogenic uh, system in order to uh, reach a certain uh, temperature uh, that would allow uh, the superconducting um, uh, phenomena to, to manifest. And of course, that would be the basis for uh, creating a qubit. So just to go through um, uh, the available technologies today, apart from the superconducting quantum qubits. So superconducting quantum qubits are actually one of the most promising technologies. And we can see that big companies like IBM and Google already investing in this technology and advancing its development really, really um, in a very, very high speed rate. And we can see milestones reached every few months. So this means that it's a really good candidate to be um, the technology used for universal quantum computers. So superconducting qubits, as their name say, is based on superconducting materials or superconducting loops, which is a resistance-free current oscillates uh, that oscillates back and forth around a circuit loop. We will see how this is manifesting. The control of the states in a superconducting quantum is actually done via microwave uh, microwave um, signals, okay, or microwave pulses, which would actually um, affect the state of the qubit to a certain um, to a certain state that we would like to achieve. And that's basically the uh, the basis of how we create quantum gates. We will go further into details on this. But other technologies which are very interesting and very promising are ion trapped qubits. Okay, so this is actually uh, one of the uh, most interesting milestones of the development of ion trapped qubits, which is um, done by Oxford, uh, I think, last year. So this would be so this would be the confinement of an atom, of course, using uh, lasers uh, to, of course, uh, later on control and uh, manipulate its state. Um, in uh, quantum computational um, exercises. So electrically charged atoms or ions simply have quantum energies that depend on the location of electrons. Tuned lasers cool and trap the ions and put them in superposition states. So we would need lasers in order to control the states of such qubits. Other technologies also which are mostly used under research in universities, but not really in industry, which are the spin qubits. So basically the orientation of the spin of the electron would determine the state. If it's up, then it's state zero. If it's down, then it's one. And if it is uh, like spinning in the middle, then it would be zero and one, not simultaneously, but rather in a superposition state of zero and one. Other technologies which uh, theoretically are promising, but still there is so many engineering challenges to overcome in order to achieve them, which are the topological qubits and the diamond vacancies qubits. Okay, so um, these are also uh, technologies under investigation, uh, but there is still a long, a long way to go in order to achieve um, interesting results. Now, what's common between all the technologies that I have presented so far is what we call the DiVincenzo criteria, which actually are five criteria that were put by um, David DiVincenzo um, yeah, in the early stages of quantum information science development. And this criteria must be met in order to evaluate whether a certain technology is a successful candidate um, to implement quantum uh, computers or quantum circuits. Okay, so first of all, we need a technology then that can actually define what a qubit is. And second, we would, we would need a technology 
uh, that would make it that would make it relatively uh, achievable to to control its state and especially to uh, initialize its state. Okay, so we wouldn't want to start our computations with with a random quantum state, but rather with a very well defined quantum state, which is usually the uh, zero state. And then, of course, in order to um, manipulate the qubits and eventually implement quantum algorithms, then we need a uh, gate or quantum gates. And for this, we don't have to implement all the gates that we know in quantum information science, but rather we can create a uh, universal set of gates, which would be supported by uh, the hardware that we are working on. And starting from this uh, set of gates, we can create any operation that we would like to apply. Okay, so that's why it's called a universal set of gates. And then we have to be able to uh, do measurements on our uh, qubits and eventually determine whether it's zero or one by the end of the measurement uh, process. And this is actually the fifth condition, which is to have a technology that has a long coherence time. So the coherence time is most, one of the most challenging uh, features for, uh, for the development of any kind of qubit. And why is that? Because particles in quantum mechanics tend to, uh, tend to go for the ground state or tend to prefer the ground state. They don't like to stay in an excited state for a very long time. And that's why we say that they decay from an excited state to the ground state. And the, this is actually a major problem because imagine that we want to go from the state zero to the state one, but we know that the particle will not stay in the state one for a very long time. It will just go back to the state zero. And this is a very natural process that we uh, still are trying to figure out how we can control it to our own advantage. But still, the timing that um, the particle can stay in an excited state is very, very limited. And in many um, technologies, this can be a very hard challenge because the time to do the measurement can be less than the time where the state stays uh, excited. So that's why uh, we can never uh, find that state is one just because it does not stay in the state one um, long enough that we can measure it. But many technologies are actually uh, working on, um, let's say, extending the coherence time. And that's why uh, we have so many challenges related to this. But um, very interesting advancements are happening with this, with this regard. So now let's start about the transmon. So the transmon is actually a very, um, let's say, a very used kind of qubits in many superconducting circuits, even though there are more superconducting qubits, like the phase and the charge qubits. Now, the transmon is used in many uh, quantum computers that are available today, and that's why I chose to have it as um, the type of uh, qubit that I would talk about in this talk. So what is the transmon? The transmon, or as the transmission line shunted uh, plasma oscillation qubit, is a type of superconducting charge qubit that is designed to have reduced sensitivity to charge noise. This is still also a challenge, which is um, the qubits that we engineer are actually sensitive to their environment uh, perturbations. And one of the uh, most noisy, let's say, uh, effects would be the noise uh, coming from uh, the charges. So we still uh, can manage to have transmons uh, also relatively stable uh, and can endure the noise coming from the from the charges and uh, it, it would be a sufficient, sufficiently good qubit uh, to have our computations done um, correctly. So the transmon consists of superconducting electrodes or islands interconnected by a Josephson junction. We will talk about the Josephson junction because of this is the, actually the main powerful feature of the, of the transmon qubit. But let's continue with our introduction. So the quantum states are encoded in oscillations of the Cooper pair across a tunnel junction between two superconducting islands where the excited state or the state one is oscillating as a higher at a higher frequency than the ground state zero. So what we need to really keep in mind from the sentence 
is that the main difference between the state zero and the state one is the frequency of each state. We say that the state one, we have our uh, Cooper pairs actually oscillating at a higher frequency. And this is where we uh, define, this is actually the state one. And at a certain lower frequency, we can determine whether um, it is in the state, in the ground state or not. So that would be the, the zero state. So actually, to keep it very simple, the transmass circuit is equivalent to the LC circuit. So the LC circuit that we have seen uh, in physics, in, in basic physics, where L is the inductance and C is the capacitance. So just as a reminder, this is what an LC circuit looks like. Okay, so we have the inductance L and we have the capacitance uh, C and we have the frequency uh, of, of this uh, circuit. However, this is not exactly what a transmon looks like. It is still an LC circuit, but the special thing about the transmon uh, circuit is that the inductance is actually substituted by a Josephson junction, which has an energy and a capacitance. Okay, now, we will see the difference between the spectrum of energy of an LC circuit and the spectrum of energy of a uh, transmon qubit circuit. And that's where uh, we will draw the main conclusion of why the transmon is uh, actually a good qubit. Okay, so let's start with the very um, basic application in quantum mechanics which is the harmonic oscillator. And let's see how the harmonic oscillator is actually the quantum mechanical, um, let's say, counterpart of the LC circuit. So the Hamiltonian of the LC circuit, when I say Hamiltonian, it simply, simply is the energy of the system. OK, it's just uh, a very widely used term in, uh, in quantum mechanics, but in simple terms, it just means energy of the system. So the Hamiltonian is the sum of the kinetic energy represented by the charge variable Q and the potential energy, which is represented by the flux variable. OK, so here we have the kinetic energy and here, of course, we have the um, potential energy. So the potential energy is coming from the inductor and uh, the um, kinetic, sorry, the kinetic energy is coming from the capacitor and the potential energy is coming from the inductor. OK, so until now, it's going smoothly. Now, what happens when we take this Hamiltonian and actually quantize it? What do we mean by quantize it? It means that we are moving to the quantum mechanical, um, let's say, description of the system, which is simply the use of operators, OK? Instead of using uh, our um, energies driven or, let's say, described by uh, the charge and the flux variables, phi and q. So in this case, of course, there are so many changes that we need to do, but I'm giving the, the results right away because this should be um, straightforward, uh, taking us to the transmon qubit after all. So the quantum harmonic oscillator is what we get when we quantize the LC circuit. So if we do some changes to our, to our Hamiltonian, we want to define the reduced flux, which would be our uh, operator phi, okay, which is also dependent of phi given in this in this equation, of course, and the reduced charge, which is n, which is of course uh, operator n uh, is related to the um, to the q that we have uh, that we have presented before. So the LC circuit Hamiltonian can be written as h. Uh, also q squared over 2c plus phi squared over 2l. But the most the interesting difference here is the use of phi and q as operators. So, um, sorry. So seeing this description, we can also add more variables in order to describe the Hamiltonian in terms of energies, okay? Uh, so specifically energies. So that's why we define ec and el and finally, we get to the expression of the quantum harmonic oscillator as described by uh, this, ex this expression. So I just wanted to say that EC and EL can be driven from phi operator and N, and N operator, okay? So if you, if you focus on the difference between the two expressions, it's just because we wanted to write the 
to write the expression in terms of n and phi, which are automatically um, linked to q uh, operator and phi operator, okay? So, just with a very simple math, you could uh, drive the expressions for EC and EF. But, just not looking at the equations, we can understand all the dynamics by looking at this photo. So, what do we have here? If you are familiar with the basic uh, applications, or applications of quantum mechanics, then you must have used the or have seen the uh, harmonic oscillator before. What the harmonic oscillator is, is a system that has its energy levels equidistant from each other. So what does this mean? Of course, we have the ground state, which is the lowest uh, energy level, okay, which is uh, symbolized by E0. It has a certain energy. Okay, and then we have the higher um, en energy level, which is also called the first excited state, also called E1. It also has a certain energy. Now, the frequency to go from the uh, lowest energy level or the ground state to the first excited state is the same frequency or the same energy to also go from the first excited state to the second. And it's also the same energy to go from the second to the third, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, knowing that it has an infinite uh, number of, um, of energy levels. Okay, so this is what we, what we uh, really need to describe the LC circuit, but in terms of quantum mechanics. So this would be the equivalent of uh, the LC circuit that we have described simply before. But as we, maybe you are familiar with um, with uh, pulses in the use of Kiskit, for example. In Kiskit, for example, they say that in order to go from the ground state to the first excited state, you need to give what is the frequency difference between the two um, energy levels in order to ensure that your particle is excited from the ground state to the first excited state. But in this case, we have the exact same frequency to go from one level to the higher level. So this has a very high risk of applying the frequency and you would go for example from two to three instead from instead of zero to one okay because it's the same because it's the same frequency then there is a very high range of error uh, causing leakage uh, of of, uh, of our computational space okay so that's why the harmonic spectrum does not make a good qubit even though it was very interesting since we have the ground state, which we can qualify as the state zero. And we have also an excited state, which we would have used as the one state. But still, from an engineering standpoint, this does not, um, this does not make up a good, uh, a good qubit, simply because there's a very high risk of applying the, applying the frequency to go from uh, two wrong energy levels. So we don't have to reject the solution of the LC circuit. But we can implement some modifications in order to be able to just use the ground state and the first excited state. For this, we need to substitute the inductor, the linear inductor, with a Josephson junction. Now, the Josephson junction is a very famous application of superconductivity. Okay? So, if you are familiar with the with the uh, theory of su of superconductivity, then these are just a reminder of the Josephson relations, which describe the current and the voltage within a, a Josephson junction. So, what is Josephson junction? It's basically two blocks of superconductors which are separated by insulator. Okay, so the insulator here will be as a barrier. What happens when we have a barrier and we have electrons? We have the tunneling effect. It means that the Cooper pair, the Cooper pair is actually uh, the reason behind why we have uh, superconductivity anyway. And you can read more about that. It's a very interesting theory of how the formation of Cooper pairs is, ac is actually the origin of superconductivity. But just to keep it very simple, is that when we, once we have this setup, it means we have superconductor, insulator, and superconductor. The electrons will not be moving across 
the uh, insulator individually, but rather they will be forming couples of electrons and they will be moving together across the, uh, across the insulator, okay? Which is what we uh, define also as the tunneling effect. So if we have a flow of copper pairs, which are actually, um, which are actually uh, electrons, then of course that would, that would generate a current and a voltage. So the inductive energy, which we call Hj, is actually defined by the uh, Josephson energy cos phi. Phi is the flux, okay? Phi, uh, sorry, uh, phi is the phase, okay? Which is defined in the wave uh, functions of each electron uh, or Cooper pairs, to be more precise. So the inductive energy, which is the energy given by our Josephson junction, in the junction is not quadratic, but a cosine function of the generalized flux through it. So this would be it. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, sorry, just um, I made a mistake. So phi would actually be the difference between phi L and phi R, which are the phases um, of the, of the uh, wave function formed at the first block of the, of the superconductor and the second block of the superconductor. Okay, and this difference, which we call phi, would be actually the generalized flux through the the uh, the tunnel, the tunnel or the insulator. Okay, it's a, just the flux that we that we uh, that is generated at um, the transmission of the copper pair from the first block to the second block of superconductors within the junction. But what we need to uh, really focus on is that there is a really big difference between the inductive energy that is given by a linear inductor and by Josephson junction. And the interesting thing is that this difference between the two uh, inductive energies will, will have a, a consequence, a considerable consequence, which is a disruption of the harmonic spectrum in a very particular way. So we don't have uh, that spectrum that, that actually uh, gives us equidistant energy levels within the harmonic oscillator. But now there is a big difference in the, in the, in the spectrum of, of, the two, of the two circuits, which would actually have the advantage of changing the frequency that we need in order to go from a low energy level to the higher one. So this is actually a very basic, um, a very basic LC circuit. We can see that the energy, which is also proportional to the to the frequency that we are using, so the frequency to go from the zero state to the one state is the same as the, the as the frequency to go from the one state to the two state. However, using the Josephson junction, as we have um, seen in the previous slide, would actually change this energy here it would change the uh, inductive energy that we need to describe our Hamiltonian. In this case, we see that the spectrum now is sinusoidal. And not only that, but the frequency to go from the ground state to the excited state, or 0 to 1, is now higher than the frequency to go from the excited state to the second excited state. And this is actually how we disrupt the, free, the, the spectrum in order to have the advantage to just choose one frequency to go from the ground state to the first excited state. So with this very, let's say, small change, yet has a very significant effect on the circuit, we now have only one frequency to be sure that we are applying the operation to go from the ground state to the first excited state. Why is that? Because as you move up, the frequency will keep on changing. Okay? So if you give one value of the frequency, then you are doing the operation that you want to do. So we call this uh, spectrum, uh, so the, sinus the sinusoidal spectrum potential yields non-equidistant energy levels which is referred to as unharmonicity. 
So unlike the harmonic oscillator, which doesn't make up a good qubit, using the transmon, we can confine. So you always hear about the confinement of the computational space to the ground and the first excited state. So using the transmon, we can confine the circuit dynamics to the ground state and the first excited state since the transition frequency from 0 to 1 is sufficiently greater than the transition frequency from 1 to 2. Hence, we prevent leakage out of the qubit subspace. Now we are sure that using the transmon qubit, which is in a very simple way, represented by the circuit, just has a capacitor and Josephson junction. We can actually uh, make sure that only one frequency is successful to um, to, to apply the operation that we want that we want uh, to to move from zero to one. So just to keep on a few modifications of the of the of the uh, Hamiltonian, just to to get to uh, a conclusion very very soon, in just in the second slide or the next slide. So just keeping with the superconductivity. So in superconducting qubits, we have the Josephson energy is actually higher than the capacitive energy, and so the flux is very very low. This actually may, uh, gives us the possibility to do some approximations. And yeah, applying these approximations, we would reach this very specific expression. OK, so again, if you are familiar with the harmonic oscillator, if you see this, uh, this part, it is very, very similar to how we describe the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator using the raising and the lowering operators. It is very similar. It's not the same, but it's very similar. OK? But what is the main difference here? It's actually the uh, capacitor energy, or minus EC, because this actually causes the unharmonicity of the, of the spectrum. And in this case, we have a component that is added, which is here. This component would actually describe how the frequency will keep on getting lower and lower as you go up in the energy levels, OK? It's as if you have a spectrum that you have, um, that was um, all the energy levels were of the same distance, of the same distance from each other. And then you wanted to open that spectrum from both sides. So now it's sinusoidal, but as if the, um, the energy levels have gotten closer to each other just because you opened that spectrum from both sides. So it's actually a very, very, uh, let's say, uh, illustrative example. But just to give you the idea of how the change of the, uh, of the inductor just gave us this very significant change in the frequency uh, of transition from one energy level to the second. So uh, we have this expression which is the uh, quantum mechanical description of the transmart qubit, which of course includes the uh, raising and lowering operators, which are very much used in quantum mechanics. But what we need to understand is that this expression includes the frequency of the qubit, okay, that you will use, which is omega zero, and delta, which is minus EC, which is the capacitance um, energy in the, uh, in, the, in the qubit, and also the uh, lowering and um, uh, the, uh, the raising and lowering uh, operators, which are mostly used to, to describe the dynamics uh, of transition within the spectrum that we are uh, dealing with. So just to continue with other transformations. So now we want to define omega. Omega would be the frequency of the, uh, of the qubit plus delta, which is minus EC. So the transmon levels have energy spacings that each differ by the unharmonicity since the frequency to go from level j to a higher level j plus 1. So the difference is actually uh, positive. OK, so that means that the frequency to, to, is actually going. Um, uh, sorry, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's positive. So the, the, the idea is that the frequency to go from 0 to 1 Let's say it's omega zero. So the frequency to go from one to two will be lower than omega zero. 
the frequency to go from two to three will be even lower, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we want to define omega as the frequency of the transmon qubit, which will define the transition from zero to one. Okay. So in the end, what do we have here? After all the trans after all the transformations and all the the um, approximation that we want to apply we will reach a very specific expression of the um, energy of the transmon, which is the energy of the transmon, or simply the Hamiltonian of the transmon, would be the sum on all levels of the frequency uh, of the frequency of that um, of that state or of that level multiplied by the state. Okay, knowing that. Until this point, we did not include the h bar because usually in computational um, exercises of quantum mechanics, we just do not use the h bar because it's a constant. But when I see the frequency here, I know that I can uh, multiply it by h bar in order to get the energy of each level in my uh, spectrum. Okay, so in the end, the transmon qubit will always be defined by the energy of the, the sum over uh, all the energies uh, and the states in that spectrum. So what do we have here? Using that expression and saying that the qubit has only to have two levels, the ground level or the ground state and the first excited state, which is the state one. So if we only only consider these two states, we will find this solution. So following the exact same expression, we have H0, which will be the uh, Hamiltonian for our, um, for our, for our transmon uh, qubit. We have the sum over all the energies, uh, over all the levels. So that would be the level 0 to the level 1 of the energy of each uh, level and the state that we are considering, okay? So the state of uh, of the level. So this would be zero because it's the energy of the ground state, which is zero, but th this is also theoretical. And then the state zero plus H bar omega Q, which is the energy of the first excited state, which is reached by the frequency omega Q and the state one. So, of course, we can um, add and subtract energy from the Hamiltonian without affecting the dynamics. It's just like simple um, uh, adaptation to the expression of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Hamiltonian in order to make it symmetrical. Otherwise, it does not affect uh, anything of the expression of the Hamiltonian. Hence, we can make the zero and the one state energy symmetric about the energy level zero. OK, by subtracting half of the qubit energy, it's just like we subtract, we subtract, sorry, we subtracted half of the energy from the uh, ground state and we added um, half of the energy for the for the one state. But this does not change the dynamics of our Hamiltonian. And in the end, we find a very significant expression that you might have seen in some references to describe the uh, Hamiltonian or the energy uh, system uh, of the of the uh, of the of the transmon qubit, which is um, minus one over two h bar omega q sigma z, and just as a reminder, sigma z is actually represented by this matrix, which is if you are familiar with quantum uh, computation, this is referring to the z gate. Okay, so what do we have here? This expression is very interesting. Why? Because, first of all, it includes the frequency that we need in order to reach the excited state. And something else, it mentions that the dynamics of our system is actually happening on the z-axis. So that's why you would see that the zero state is actually represented by, um, yeah, by the north pole which is on the z axis and on the opposite side you will see that also the one state is represented in the south pole and again on the z axis why 
Why this choice for the z-axis? It's mostly because the dynamics of the transmon is um, is actually explained by uh, the, 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 the z matrix, okay? So the, all the dynamics can be uh, described by um, uh, the z-axis, so that would be the basis for our computational space. But something else, this also tells us that the measurement is indeed uh, a projection on the uh, on the z-axis. Okay, so that's why, for example, our computational space is um, is conf is superposed on the z-axis rather than x or y in the Bloch sphere. Okay, so I hope it ha it was clear up until now because it's very interesting, I would say. And please, if you have any questions, let me know because I really want you to, once and for all, understand why these pulses deal with frequencies um, uh, to begin with. But also, I wanted to uh, mention something else in this presentation, which is the Rabi oscillations. So, when we say that our particle would go from the zero state to the one state, so, Actually, this does not happen abruptly. We would say, for example, we have an electron, which is in the state one. This is just uh, an example, but we can project it on the state zero and one instead of one and two. But let's say we have an electron in the state one, okay? We have the energy difference between uh, one and two levels given by delta E which also can give us the frequency we need to go from uh, one to two. So for the electron to go from the one state to the two state, it does not happen abruptly, but rather it takes time to travel from one level to the second. And as I said in the beginning, particles do not like to be in an excited state for long. They're kind of lazy. They always want to go to the least least the sorry they always want to return back to the state that gives them the least energy or let's say to they generate the least energy so that's why we cannot stay in the excited state for long and our particle will also travel back to the excited to the uh, first excited state now if we repeat this procedure many times so up and down and up and down and up and down, then we will see that there is a sinusoidal path or pattern that's happening for the uh, transition of our particle within this system. Okay, so now if we project this example on our uh, ground state and first excited state, so this would be state zero and state one, we will see that to go from the state zero to the one, then the particle will have to travel and you can see that all these states that she takes up to the state zero are all possible states which are a combination of zero and one. Okay, so that's why we define the superposition of states as a, com as a linear combination of zero and one, because they are literally states that are between zero and one. So the particle gets excited and then it gets de-excited and slowly it gets back to the state zero. And then again, if we want to excite it again, it will travel from zero to one, traveling all the way up to one. And any state in between is a possible state for our particle. So, for example, to go from zero to one, we apply a pi pulse. Okay? Of course, um, the pi pulse is, is also defined by the duration that the particle takes to go from zero to one. If we apply pi, if we apply a half of pi or pi half, then it would travel to the state of perfect superposition between zero and one. What do we mean perfect superposition? Is that the probability to measure the state is 0 0.50 plus 0 0.51, okay? So let's read here. In the case of a two-level system, which is 
the general definition of what a qubit is. So the qubit in the general manifestation, it's, it is just a two-level quantum mechanical system. Okay, so that's why we have so many technologies uh, running in the uh, in the in the quantum computing field. Just because there are so many quantum mechanical systems which can be confined into two level systems and thus they make up a possible qubit. So that's why we have this diversity of technologies. It's just the host system which makes the difference between all these technologies. But in the end, the principle is the exact same. We just need a technology that would give us a two-level quantum mechanical system. So the system evolution is defined by the Rabi oscillations. So as you can see, the sinusoidal uh, pattern is known as the Rabi oscillations, which are the signature for the quantum superposition. <coughs> so for a two-level quantum system subject to a perturbation independent of time coupling to the, to the two states, so that means this two-level quantum system is subject to an excitation uh, procedure. The probability, which is also dependent of time, of finding the system at an excited state is a sinusoidal variation over time. So this is actually the pattern that describes the changing of probability of measuring the state of our particle as it evolves from uh, state zero to the state one. P max, of course, is one when it is at the excited state. P is zero when it is in the um, uh, <clears throat> when it is in the uh, <clears throat> sorry in the in the in the lower state. And omega is the Rabi frequency. So Rabi oscillations are a proof of superposition. Excuse me. <laughs> so what happens now? What about the engineering of transmon qubits? So uh, I did not go into the coupling of qubits and with the resonators because that would be a very interesting subject, but it's also very, very time consuming. So that's why I did not include it. But on a general overview, in a quantum chip, we have more than one qubit, of course. And we have to consider what channels we need to add in order to control the state of the qubit, to read out the state of the qubit, but also how we can connect the qubits between each other so that we can apply two qubit quantum gates. So the use of Josephson junction, which is a nonlinear and dissipationless circuit element, disrupts the harmonic energy spectrum and confines the system to only two levels, which are the ground state and the first excited state. The frequency of transition from 0 to 1 is typically at 6 gigahertz. And the transition from the state 1 to the state 2, which is defined by delta minus EC, is lower by 300 megahertz, which is actually a very uh, significant difference between the two frequency. So 300 megahertz is sufficient enough in order to um, make the pulses significantly uh, distinguishable for the transition from 0 to 1 and from two, uh, from 1 to 2, which is, which is sufficient to confine the dynamics of the, uh, of the lowest two levels when performing single qubit gates with pulses of duration of 20 nanoseconds, which is actually a very good record. So, for this image, for example, we have a quantum chip of five qubits. Sorry, I wrote four. It's five. So for these five qubits, then we need, of course, resonators to apply entanglement to couple qubits because that would uh, that would be the way we can um, make sure the interaction between the two uh, qubits is happening for the two qubit gates. And we have the resonators which are also uh, used for the readout and the application of quantum gates, okay? They are uh, both resonators, which means they are um, wave guidelines. So we, we send electrical pulses, right? So through these uh, resonators at certain frequencies in order to apply certain quantum gates. And then the information that we get back from the qubit is also gotten back um, from the resonator. So 
I will just keep it brief on the quantum control or the qubit control, which is the single qubit gate. Uh, I will not uh, go through the two qubit gates, but I will answer it if there is a question. So qubit operations are driven using Rabi oscillation. So as I said, once you know the frequency to go from the ground state to a certain state, then you just apply that frequency and you get what you want. By applying an, an external oscillating electrical field on the transmon qubit at the free at the qubit frequency. That's what's really important about the frequency of the qubit. So performing desired gates require a short pulse with the correct phase, amplitude, and length. This way, any rotation within the xy plane can be performed. So to push the limit of the short pulse duration, a Gaussian-shaped envelope is used in combination with the drag or the derivative removal by adiabatic gates, which is just a technique for the creation of uh, electrical pulses. So this is the drag scheme, okay? So we have added a component, which is sinusoidal, in order to make sure that there is no leakage from the frequency of 0, 1, 2, uh, 1, and 2. Okay, uh, of course, there are more information or to understand why this component uh, actually prevents that uh, leakage. And this actually does not affect the pulse area, the pulse area, which is defined by the length that, uh, multiplied by the phase, I think. I can verify this information, but I think this is what the pulse area means. Uh, that's basically saying that the drag scheme or the drag technique does not uh, change much about the uh, correct pulse uh, regarding the phase amplitude and length. And in this case, the technology that we have used today actually uh, gives us quantum gates that have a duration of more than five nanoseconds and fidelity of more than 99%. Okay? And the rotation angle is unchanged. This is mainly uh, regarding the application uh, within the XY plane. <clears throat> so, as we, as we have said, in order to apply uh, a quantum gate, and we need to manipulate electrical pulses. By manipulating electrical pulses, we need to know the frequency of the qubit to move from 0 to 1, and uh, we would apply uh, a Gaussian shape in a combination with the drag technique. Okay, in the end, this is what we get. So we have a Gaussian shape pulse. The, the drag, the drag uh, is not really clear here, but it's still a combination. Uh, and this actually, the frequency of this pulse will determine what is the gate we are applying. So let's give you an example, for example. <laughs> That's not a sentence. Let's give you an example. So we want to apply a rotation around the X gate on a qubit. Let's put that the theta is the angle that we would like to apply. In this case, the microwave pulse has to be sent at the transition frequency from 0 to 1, okay, with a zero phase. Okay, so the phase would actually be zero for, for the application of rotations around the X gate. Now, what is the difference between the x-axis and the y-axis in the Bloch sphere? It's simply a pi-half phase. So that's why any rotation around the y-axis would be also a microwave pulse at the frequency of transition from 0 to 1, but this time the phase is pi-half. Okay? This actually gives us the x-gate. Okay? So the x-gate would be uh, a pulse at the frequency of transition from zero to one, and the phase is zero. The phase cannot be shown within the uh, within the um, the image of the pulse, okay? But it's only the amplitude that is shown. Same thing for y. So as you can see, y and x are actually very similar if you look at them. But it's actually the encoding of the pulse that makes the difference, simply because the phase does not show in the illustration of the pulse. Only the amplitude and the frequency, uh, if of course you add that 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 component. So, 
X and, and Y, of course, are the rotation around the X and Y axis with pi pulse, uh, with pi with the pi angle. Sorry. Why? Because, for example, if you apply X gate to the state zero, then you will move to the, uh, the state one, right? So that's why we say that the X gate is a rotation around the X axis with the pi with the pi angle. So what about the Z gate? The Z gate is also one of the most interesting implementation of, of gates. So it's actually very hard to um, control the qubit on a 3D uh, on a 3D level. What we do actually is the application of pulses only in the X Y uh, plane. But what's really interesting is that the combination of X and Y, the combination of operation of X and Y, would automatically give us the the Z uh, the Z operation. So. If you are familiar with the Pauli gates, which are which are the Pauli matrices, which are the X, Y, and Z gates in quantum computation, if you apply X by Y, then you will find the Z gate. Just a very simple uh, matrix multiplication. Just do it if you have a pen and a paper. Just multiply the matrices X by Y, then you will find Z. And if you apply, I guess, uh, Y X, then you will find minus Z. So that's the interesting point, is that when we apply X operation, then Y operation, then it will be affecting um, the, Z, the Z phase or the, the, um, the Z axis, sorry. So that's why we call the Z gate a virtual Z, because we don't send an electrical pulse to implement the Z gate, but rather it's a combination of application of X and Y that would give us Z. And Z actually is only affecting the face of the qubit. Okay, so remember that when you apply the Z gate, for example, to the state minus, then you will move to the state plus. And why is that? It's because you have affected the face of the state. You did not affect the amplitude and you did not affect the components or the coefficients. So that's why you also do not see the pulse of the Z gate simply because it's only encoded in the phase and do not encode it in the amplitude. So these are actually images from my work. I have been implementing uh, different gates on the uh, on the hardware that I'm working on. Um, if, you, if you need any information on the qubit control, then please let me know. So let's get to the end of the presentation and do an evaluation of the technology that we have been using so far, which is the technology of superconducting quantum chips. So as I said, many companies, be it startups or big companies, are really investing and betting on this technology that it will bring us the universal quantum computer. But does this mean that this technology is actually perfect? No, it is not. So from the advantages that we use, uh, that we have in superconducting quantum, uh, quantum computers, is that they actually have high designability. It means that we know how to design them, we have the electronics for it, we have the control system for it, and they are extendable. Is it extendable or extensible? Extensive. So we can extend them to, to add more qubits, okay? And we can extend them even more to, to implement more resonators and to have a better interaction with the qubits. So they're easy to couple also. So the circuit nature of the superconducting qubit uh, system makes it relatively easy to couple multiple qubits together. In general, superconducting qubits can be coupled by capacitance or inductance. So for the uh, bus, which is called the coupling bus actually within the quantum chip, you can use actually just one uh, coupling bus that would uh, make the relations between all the qubits within one quantum chip. OK, and then um, depending on the frequency that you will be sending, then you will be affecting uh, certain qubits. And something else is that with the technology that we have today, it's easy to control these quantum chips. We have the electronics for it. We have the technology for it. So the operation and measurement of superconducting qubits are compatible with the microwave control and opera opera operability. Sorry. So. Commercial microwave devices and equipment can be used in superconducting quantum computing experiments. 
What's new here is actually the cryogenic system, which is the system that we need to go from the um, from the room temperature to practically zero degrees, which is very, very low and takes at least three days to reach. Apart from that, and the design of the quantum chip, then everything else is, um, is actually achievable by any research group. So what are the, the disadvantages? So as I have just mentioned, they require near absolute zero temperatures to operate. For example, IBM Quantum, the quantum chips are actually operating at 15 millikelvin. So that's basically absolute zero. Okay, so it's very hard to achieve that that energy that uh, the temperature. It's very time consuming and also very energy consuming. Something else, they are still very susceptible to quantum noise. Which is the quantum noise coming from? They're coming from um, resonators because when we send electrical pulses, that's like sending photons, okay? So that would cause noise in the end because they'll be interacting with the particles at the same scale that they will be affecting each other. And something else is that the coherence time in quantum chips is still very low. So they retain their quantum states for short periods. But the, lucky th the good thing here is that it's manageable and it's improving over time. So the coherence time, is at least we can say that it's actually improving uh, quite remarkably. So that was all. Thank you so much for attending this session. I hope it was very informative. Uh, I was on time, just one hour. Exactly. So now I would like to take a couple of questions, or so maybe like 10 minutes for the questions. Um, yes. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was magnificent. Thank you. Uh, and awesome. That is the first thing. And the second thing is that um, I, I have already sent you a couple of questions regarding, uh, you know, uh, your your presentation. Uh, so uh, let, let us first, um, just a second. So let us first um, um, ask you uh, the questions that was in, in I mean, that were in, in, in the form itself. So uh, regarding uh, the current technology of, of transbound qubits, um, let's say that uh, they are perfect and they are uh, pure. For example, they, they are not susceptible to any noise at all. So can, can we use it for quantum communication or do you think that photonics are like, more suitable for this? Um, okay, so what I know is that in quantum communications, they usually use photons. Okay, so why is that? It's mostly because the entanglement between the photons is technically achievable. Okay, and um, the the maintenance of the interaction between the the photons in state of entanglement is only dependent of how many quantum repeaters you have in your quantum communication network. So basically with the maturity of the quantum repeaters, then we will have better uh, quantum communication thanks to the entanglement of photons in, in, this, in this case. So I would say that uh, with the same approach, if we say that the transmon is uh, also at the state of maturity, that uh, the maintenance of entanglement state is achievable, and the transmission of quantum information is also achievable uh, without uh, much effect coming from the noise. Then yes, we can use um, you, we can use uh, transmon for for nodes of communication in in any um, uh, network of of quantum communications. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, another question from the forum: um, What are the states uh, or what are the state of the art techniques for implementing high fidelity C node gates? Okay, so for the C node gates, it's also um, for the transmon qubits, it's also at very high uh, advancement speed regarding the fidelity. It's not also 100%, but we are uh, also at a very high um, uh, rate for, for the fidelity of the, of the gate. So, what happens for this for the implementation for the C node gate? So, for the C node gate, it's actually based on the implementation of the iSwap gate, okay? So I can just um, show you something, which is, by the way, 
a very good resource for anyone who would like to know how the engineering of uh, superconducting qubits is happening. It's a very, very good resource. So, um, yeah, that would be it. So, so for the CNOT gate, as I said, it's based on the implementation of the ISWAP gate. Okay, so let me get to that part. So, this is actually the decomposition of the C not gate. Where is it? Just a second. No, these are the gates. I'm not do this. Um, Yeah, sorry. So this is actually how we implement the C0 gate. So if we have a controller and we have a target, this is actually the very basic decomposition of what the C0 gate is. And once we implement the sequence of instructions, then we make sure that the C0 is uh, very well implemented. Now, here is the interesting thing, is that you see these Z gates, they're actually virtual gates it means that they are not physically implemented. So we can say that they are error-free, okay? It's only the noise coming from the implementation of the X, X and I swap and I swap. So this would be the most efficient way of implementing the C0. Now, the interaction between the two qubits is actually implemented using the, C, the I swap gate. The I swap gate, as a reminder, it actually uh, gets us from the state, um, for example, zero one to one zero, without, of course, including the i of the of the complex phase. Okay, I'm just talking about the state in themselves. So the i swap gate will move us from will move us from the state one zero to zero one, or vice versa. How does this happen? First of all, we prepare the state. Let's say one zero. That means we excite one qubit and we leave the second qubit on. Uh, the ground level, and then the frequency that is the difference between the two qubits, we implement a we, we implement an electrical pulse, a pulse that is working on that frequency, and the consequence is that there is an exchange of excitation between the two qubits in the state. Okay, and since we are talking about an exchange of excitation, then that means that there is. Um, is swapping in the excitation between the two qubits. So that's why we move from one zero to zero one. So the interesting thing is that even the implementation of the I swap gate is happening here. So as you can see, so we like moving from from uh, zero one uh, from yeah from zero to one is actually an exchange of excitation that is happening here. You can also uh, see it in terms of phase. So this actually would be a very, very interesting uh, resource that you would like to, to maybe look at if you want to uh, see more of how the engineering of superconducting quantum qubits is happening. Uh, even though it's a little bit, I wouldn't say outdated, it's still valid. But still, I think it's a very good uh, introduction to the field. And after that, you can stay updated with the... Um, with the advancements happening uh, in 2021 and uh, onwards. Okay, thank you for this answer. Um, I actually have a question regarding uh, the C note itself. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, what I know is that IPM or currently actually uh, uses the C note as like one of the basis gates uh, for uh, for its quantum hardware alongside with the X and the square X and also the Z rotation and the identity with the measurement and reset. So the C note in, in IPM is like um, one of like the, uh, you know, the basic gates that we use to decompose other or to create other unitaries. And here you said that the C note is or, or is already decomposed by using swap gates and, and, uh, and X gates. So uh, is, is that paper for another technology or is it is just like something inherited inside IPM quantum computers itself? Uh, okay, so just I want to verify something is that 
Yeah, well, this paper is actually given from uh, basically MIT, um, MIT research groups, okay? So I know that it's the same presentation that was given previously in one of the um, series. Uh, it's actually available on the Qiskit series uh, on YouTube. I cannot remember which lecture exactly, but they presented the same engineering uh, approach to the implementation of the C node. So as you can see, the universal set of gates that is used is basically X, Y, and Z. And from there, we can uh, compose any other interaction that you, or operation that we would like to implement. So the fact that the C node in itself is an assembly of other, uh, of other, let's say, operations or gates, we can, once we implement it, we can use it as also one of the basis gates to implement other operations. So one, let's say, one, um, one technique does not exclude the other. Okay, so it's possible that IBM Quantum is also using the exact same technology. I can verify this information. I can go back to the lecture that uh, I have on, on, on my mind. Uh, but what I know is that this is the one of the most efficient ways to implement the C node gate, uh, simply because you reduce the errors uh, using the Z gates and the, inter the exchange of interactions between the two qubits is happening through the ISWAP gate. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. That was enlightening. Okay, um, so we have some questions uh, from the chat. So mm -hmm. uh, a, a question from James Allen. He says that typically, what are ions or atoms that are used in, in trapped ion technology in, in, in general? Um, I don't have much information at least from from the implementation of quantum qubits of uh, quantum uh, chips based on ion traps but practically it's uh well, theoretically speaking you can use any ion in its simplest form but i think it's the helium for the for the application of cold atoms and the uh, laser and the laser control so I'm sorry, I don't have the correct answer for the uh, use of ions for the ion trapped qubits, but I know for applications of cold quantum, no, for cold atoms, it's mostly helium, silicium. Um, what's silicium in English? It's okay. It's okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. So uh, yeah, I'm maybe not I'm not the right person to answer that question. Sorry. That's no, okay. So another question from James. Uh, he was also wondering about um, Sterniger like experiment, which involved deflection uh, or yes, the deflection of silver atoms using magnets. And then uh, he he was actually wondering about how can we experiment uh, with uh, with uh, with free electrons? I mean, how can we analyze free electrons instead of just the atom itself? You know, how can we analyze the spin of of a um, of a free electron. Well, the orientation of the spin is actually depending on the <coughs> on the magnetic uh, flux that you are that you are um, that you are uh, applying. That's basically uh, from a physics standpoint, this is possible. So, uh, in a very specific engineering set, then you can have all these circumstances. Uh, available for the spin of the qubit or the spin of the uh, electron to be either oriented upward, and that would mean that the computation is referred to the state zero, or if it's um, downwards, and that would mean that it's referred to the state one. And um, I would say that it's all um, it's all encoded within the within the uh, the use of the magnetic flux in order to control the state of the um, of the spin the orientation of the spin okay thank you thank you so much um actually uh, abdul malik is saying good day to you so and good day to you abdul malik thank you. Uh, a question from sobham um uh, he was he was actually asking about: uh, Are there any other complications instead of, you know, the uh, the Josephson junction itself? 
Are, uh, sorry, what do you mean? Are there any are, are, are there any other complications alongside the uh, the trust for some junction itself? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm don't understand what's, what do you mean by the complication? I'm sorry, just maybe. So he was, he, I, I believe that I believe that he is asking about uh, the uh, the designing of the cupid itself. So yep. he, you you only mentioned that we use uh, the trust for some junctions. Okay, to create mm -hmm. or to to apply some anhermicity so that mm -hmm. we can uh, widen uh, widen the gap between uh, level one and level two, and level zero and level one will be like a little bit close to either to each other. Okay, so no, it's kind of the, the the state the levels one and two get closer but not widened. But yeah, I, I understand the point. Closer. Oh, okay, okay. So perhaps I get it wrong. So, any anyway, uh, he is asking if there are any other uh, complications or any other, you know, uh, modifications or technical designs ah. that you could mention. Ah, okay. So it's mostly the use of the Josephson junction that would give us the um, advantage of her, of unharmonicity of the spectrum of energies within one qubit. But we can say that the quantum chip extends beyond one qubit. So I did not give the entire um, quantum chip of how it is really designed, but within the resource that I, the paper that the review rather that I have shared with you, there is a very detailed description of how the qubits are assembled between the quantum chip and how the connection between the resonators and the, the qubit is established using the capacitors. And of course the hard the the control system is quite complicated, so you would need so much of uh, signal analysis and signal uh, treatment or processing, sorry, in order to understand um, uh, the quantum state that you get. But I would say that the, the most remarkable thing about the qubit, uh, especially the transmon, is the integration of the Josephson junction, because that is the feature that really uh, made it possible uh, to meet the condition of uh, the two level quantum system that we need to implement the qubit. OK, thank you. Thank you. So um, Everton is saying awesome. Uh, Vishal is saying uh, awesome presentation. Maya is also saying great presentation. Uh, Faraz Nuri is saying thank you so much. It was great. Um, I think that there is a question from from Abdelmalik. He's saying, uh, right, Sahar, regarding why using photonics in communications is also the already existence of the optical fiber backbones. Okay, exactly. Yes. Not, okay, this is not an uh, this is not a question. Uh, um, from Lauren, uh, she's saying thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, are, are there any questions? So. Um, Okay, from Diego, he's saying that awesome presentation. Is it possible to correct measurement readout errors with hardware in a fashion that is faster and more precise than, say, you know, uh, in, in Kiskit Agnes, we have some post processing techniques which we can actually use to uh, mitigate errors. So, um, can, can we use, uh, you know, uh, any other way? To be, you know, faster when when we use the cupids, so that we can mitigate the errors instead of Kiskit Ignis itself. Yeah, Kiskit Ignis is mostly dealing with um, the simulation part of error correction, but the real implementation of error correcting algorithms is happening at the hardware itself. So, the implementation of uh, error correction algorithms would need a very large number of qubits, which we have not really reached today. That's why you are talking about, about uh, the um, fault-tolerant quantum computer be, being um, a little bit late, later in years. That's mostly because the suppression of errors within uh, a quantum chip is still not achievable. But anyways, you can read more about the fault-tolerant um, design of quantum chip and you can read more about the implementation of error correcting algorithms but as an overview there are only two types of errors happening in the qubit either um, a phase shift or the um, state flipping that means what is the what is the state flipping it's as if you have 
state one, which became zero or vice versa. So that is very similar to the application of the X gate. And a phase shift is, uh, or sorry, a phase flip also, which is similar to the application of the Z gate. So there are four torrent, uh, sorry, there are error correcting uh, algorithms which would detect exactly where this error has happened and it would uh, it would apply the inverse application so if our algorithm or our technique for uh, error correction has detected that there is um, a state flip on the third qubit for example within a four uh, qubit quantum chip then simply it would just apply an x gate to reverse that error same thing with the phase flip okay it would detect at which level we have um, we have phase flip and it would uh, apply a z gate in order to reverse that that error so this is of course not as easy um, to understand as i have just said it because the detection of such errors is still challenging but we know what to do okay we have already put only two categories for these errors we know how to correct them or how to inverse them, but the interesting part is how to detect them at first. For this, uh, I really invite you to, to read more about the fault tolerant design of quantum chips and of error correction algorithms on real hardware. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I know that we only have four, four minutes or uh, maybe less than four minutes, but I, I have a very small question, uh, a very small question um, regarding the Hadamard gate. So uh, when we say that from, from a physical point of view, uh, we, we are just, we are just giving like, like uh, a very short pulse, for example, like pi over two, like in, in in the RAPI uh, figure that you uh, that you showed in the presentation, so we we are giving like a very short a very short pulse, like pi over two, as I said, and then uh, the qubit might be in like in in the first while. I mean like in in, um, in like state one or perhaps in state zero, and uh, it's not like you know jumping back and forth, but whenever we uh rerun the circuit over and over and over we will get like a pattern of zeros and ones that should be extremely close to each other like a binomial, a binomial distribution so is, is that correct from a physical point of view okay so uh just to correct something um Kedir, actually the implementation of the hadamard gate does not mean that we are applying a pi half pulse why is that because when we apply the hadamard gate theoretically if we apply Hadamar on zero, we get to plus. If we apply Hadamar on plus, we get back to zero. However, if we apply a pi half pulse, then we would get to a uh, superposition state of zero and one. But we, if, if we apply a pi half again, we don't go back to zero, but rather we go to one. So it's not accurate to say that um, the, the, the short pi half pulse would be the implementation of the Hadamar gate. But still, that's a very interesting remark because also just let me share my screen and i will be very very quick uh, just just to show you how the implementation of the so i'm not sure if this is very clear but the hadamard gate is actually you have to decompose it in terms of x and y gates okay so in this case it would be the implementation of um of half of y, so that would be half of the angle by two, and then the x gate. So this is actually the implementation of the Hadamard gate. Okay. But, this is yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is actually the implementation of the of the uh, of the h gate. Uh, U one is exactly z gate. U two mm -hmm. is also the implement is also decomposed in terms of uh, z rotation, y rotation, and z rotation. U3 is also decomposed in terms of Z rotation, X rotation, Z rotation. You, you see that all the qubits, all, all the operations are actually decomposed in terms of uh, X, Y, and Z. The interesting th thing also is that when we say, for example, um, rotation around Y with angle pi half, this only 
actually means that the amplitude will be reduced by half. Actually, mm -hmm. the angle is proportional to the amplitude. So it's really interesting to see that the, impl the implementation of y is similar to x, but as you can see, it's just half the amplitude. So technically speaking, this is um, theoretically, theoretically very feasible, but still uh, the challenges is um, happening on other, on other aspects. So um, I just want to correct this this um, this information. But uh, would you please repeat the other the other part of the question? I'm sorry, I forgot it. Okay, no, no, no it's okay. So um, what I'm saying is that um, the application of the Hadamard itself. Uh, so some people say that okay, uh, the the qubit or the electron might be like between uh, the zero state or the one state. Okay, but this, physically this is wrong because we don't have something between the levels. It is either the zero or one. So, what I'm saying here is that uh, this pulse, that uh, or practically practically speaking, uh, the the y and then the x pulses uh, are just uh, you know pushing the the qubit or uh, or the quantum system into the uh, into the excited state, and in another uh, run of the system, uh, it just keeps uh, the the qubit. In, uh, in the zero state itself, it, it doesn't do anything. So whenever we uh, repeat the measurement over and over and over, I mean, rerunning the, the whole experiment, like with a thousand shots, uh, it should be like half of them are only zero and the other half is only one. So we get a binomial distribution. Mm -hmm. So is, 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 is my thinking valid or not? Um, so if I repeat the question, so you're asking why the application of the Hadamard gate would eventually uh, get us distribution of zero and, and one? Mm. I know perhaps it might be like, like a little bit, you know, philosophical in a way, but... It's okay. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I, I'm actually interested in this one because when I see that we have some pulses, that means that I'm, I'm already giving the system some energy. So mm -hmm. it should be like, in in a way or another, it should be like uh, a little bit excited. But and then um, when we measure it or when we do a measurement, in in some situations we have some zeros. So at the end it could be like like half zero and half one, and and and, and that's it. So uh, how how do we get the zero? despite you know applying uh some 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 phases i mean i mean some pulses for example like the y and the x pulses so i would just get back to the definition for the measurement in this case so as you have seen in the definition of the hamiltonian for the uh, for the transmon the 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 the, the measurement is actually uh, a projection on the on the z-axis, okay? So the only two possible outcomes would be either zero or one. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's actually even given we all know this. We we have the computational basis that we are using, but now we understand why it's actually either zero or one. But for the application of the Hadamar gate, it's really at the superposition. And uh, yeah, it's basically it's basically as I saw, as I as I shown as I show what's the verb as I just put it in the Rabi oscillation. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's okay. as as it's shown in the, in the Rabi oscillation, the the position is really like equidistant from zero or one. You know, so once mm -hmm. you do the the um, and it's actually probabilistic distribution. So mm -hmm. it's. It's actually a projection of either zero or one when it's actually a perfect state of zero and one, at, not at the same time, but rather perfect superposition between the two. So if you repeat the measurement multiple times and you know that the only possible outcomes are either zero or one, then it's coherent to only find zero and one nearly to a perfect state, which is zero, zero and zero dot five for one. Um, it's kind of, it's of, of course, the probability is coming with the repeat, with the, um, with repeating the experiment multiple times. And, um, it's actually the, um, uh, accumulation of results that would give us the distribution that we want to see in the end, but it's as if the particle 
same sorry, distance I, between I, zero I and one, well. and it has. Um, your voice is breaking. Get him? Yeah. Um, sorry, I think I have problem with my connection. It keeps on having the error message. Okay, now I can hear you. But when the particle is at the superposition state, which is applied by the Hadamar, then it's basically at the same distance between zero and one. And once you project that particle on the computational basis, so it really has the exact same probability or susceptibility to be fallen into the zero or one. I'm not sure if we are still on the same line of thoughts. Yes, 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 yeah. Well, at the end, we uh, the Hamiltonian should be projected on the z axis, okay? And uh, and whether we have like uh, like a zero or one, it actually depends on the nature of of the quantum mechanical system itself. So I I already know that, but uh, you know, it is extremely intriguing and interesting that despite applying some some operation to the quantum system itself or giving it some energy at the end, uh, the output, you know. Is zero. So oh. <laughs> this, this is this is a bit weird, but at the end, this is quantum oh. mechanics. Um, yeah, because it's really explained in terms of probability and measurement projection. Really, it's as if like you have, it's as if you have two holes, I would say, and you would like to throw your 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 I don't know a ball or something within one of the holes. If it is at the same holes, then you can, after repeating the experiment from multiple times, then it would fall into one of them. I think that's actually the dynamics that would mm -hmm. maybe explain it a little, because by the distance, I would say it's the same probability, either fall on zero or fall on one, and these are only the two possibilities in that case. So yeah, it's really interesting, as you have said, as you give the, ener the system some energy, but it still chooses to fall back, not fall forward for one okay okay thank you thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and your wonderful uh, answers um and uh, i hope that we can see you again in, in hepatitis series and thank you everyone for joining us today it was a pleasure and uh, we will uh, work on releasing this uh, this video very soon on YouTube and also uh, the uh, the previous meeting for quantum algorithms for chemistry and beyond. We will also put it uh, on YouTube. Um, finally, th there is a question regarding your uh, your uh, presentation. Um, is it okay to send it to other people or is it uh, for internal use only? I mean, you know, mm. some use only. No, I don't mind sending it. It's really information that's available everywhere. Well, except okay. for the implementation of the X, Y, and Z. But anyway, it's not really interesting thing to, to hide. I will publish it anyway. So, okay. so um, but yeah, I really encourage anyone who would like to learn more of the subject to just go to the review that I sent. I cannot recommend it enough. It's one of the best resources I had throughout my master thesis. And I think it would be very helpful to anyone beginning in this aspect of quantum computing, which is the hardware control of superconducting quantum chips. That is perfect. I can I, can I also add some some a small reference if that's okay with you? Oh uh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm just guiding the other people to just you know head over to Cascade um, textbook and to check the hardware chapter. It has amazing uh, introductory uh, stuff for uh, for uh, you know transform qubits and how can we use them, and uh, it has some great tutorials for Cascade Pulse. It, it's really amazing. So. Um, Again, with uh, with the review that Sahara already provided us, I think the Cascade textbook is uh, is a good way to start for uh, for quantum hardware in general. So thank you, thank you again, Sahara. Uh, thank you, James. We'll stop uh, the recording right now. Just a second. Okay. Okay. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye.